This is the Moog Labyrinth, a generative dual sequencer analog synth in the 60HP semi-modular format. In this video, I'm gonna talk about my experience using the Labyrinth for the last month, who I think it's for, what it excels at, what I think it's missing, and my overall thoughts on a fun new synth from Moog. If you like this content and plan on picking up a Labyrinth, or any synth for that matter, consider using my affiliate links below. They directly support what I do here on the channel. So some legalities to get out of the way. Moog sent this over to me to review. Uh, no money was exchanged hands. I get to say whatever I want about this unit. There is no stipulation to say good or bad things about it. I'm gonna give my honest feedback. And to be honest, if this was a turd, I wouldn't be making this video. I would send it back and say, Sorry, you made a turd. Good news is this is actually a really cool box. I'm not gonna go through every single feature and this is not gonna be like a video manual. This is gonna be my experience with it over the past month because I've had it for just over a month at this point. And what exactly is the Labyrinth? It's kind of its own collaborative thing. So if you're used to randomization in sequences or if you're used to things with chance, like say the electron workflow with the way the step sequencer works, think that, but a bit further with less control over the specific notes. Kind of. <laughs> so let's have a quick overview here. You have two oscillators. One is a regular VCO that's just a sine wave, and then the other is a modulation VCO. So it can be slowed down for modulation sources, or it can be a secondary oscillator because it can be pitched up. You then have a mixer section for both these VCOs plus ring modulation built into it and noise, which is then fed into a wave folder which is, I believe, new for Moog. And then also a two-pole variable filter, which can go from low pass to band pass and blend between the two. Both of these are fed the same source from the mixer, but you can also patch in as well. But between these two, you can actually control the order. So you can treat it as if they're parallel and then blend with this knob right here. Or you can have the wave folder going into the filter, which is nice to control some of those harmonics that get added with the wave folding. And vice versa as well, you can go from the filter into the wave folder. And the blend knob, once again, can control how much of the, the pair you get versus just the filter or just the wave folder. You got resonance for the filter. It does not self-oscillate, but it does have a nice character to it. You have a utility mix, which is nice for things that don't have an attenuator knob, uh, like the blend. Uh, and then your standard volume and the patch bay. And then the star of the show, at least in my opinion, it's the star, is the parallel sequencer right here. So there's two eight-step sequencers here that have a lot of flexibility for performance. You have the two corrupt knobs right here, which can actually flip bits and control values. You have a bunch of settings right here for controlling things like length, quantization, chaining the two sequences together, uh, subdivision of the actual clock and all that. And this, this card right here actually comes with the box and it's a bit of a cheat sheet for things. So with the corruption knob, if it's above noon or past noon, it will start writing uh, rhythm. Prior to noon, it's going to just write values. And if it's all the way uh, counterclockwise, then it's going then it's not going to change anything. It's going to keep whatever's in the memory right here, which is actually pretty handy for having some consistency. Moving on from here, we have the quantization range of what these sequencers do. If you have it all the way counterclockwise, then it's whatever the, f the frequency is tuned to or whatever note you've played essentially on the keyboard that uh, is going into the MIDI right here. And this is once again very useful so you can have like a calm not crazy type of sequence and then start increasing more range and have some interesting variety hop in. Finally, we have the, the trig mix and the decay values. This second decay controls how long the notes are. And EG1 decay controls things like these type of modulations over here, which is easier to show. So I'll get on to some more examples of that. But before we do that, I wanna say, that I think this synthesizer is an intermediate to advanced synthesizer. This is the type of thing where if someone was new to synthesis and they're like, oh, I'll pick up the Moog Labyrinth and see what's up. I think you could get discouraged pretty fast. You definitely need to understand concepts of synthesis really well. And you also need to understand some music theory as well. So with those two things combined, this is a really awesome box to uh, perform with. If you don't understand those things, then you could just randomly run into a corner that sounds bad and then end up staying there and not know how to get out of it. So if you're already well aware of the modular world and know exactly what's up with your synthesis, then this is gonna be an excellent collaborative box. So let me show you some stuff here. With these two sequencers, the way it's set up is sequencer one goes to VCO, the regular VCO, and sequencer two goes to the mod VCO. You can patch it to do other stuff. And in a different example, I will be showing uh, the sequencers in use for different VCOs that are outside of uh, the Labyrinth, which honestly is very powerful. So if you wanna tune these VCOs, a couple things need to happen. First off, your sequencer range right here should be all the way counterclockwise. And the second thing is the sequencer amount right here should be all the way clockwise. 
So you can see on here it says QTZ, QTZ. That means it's fully quantizing and tuning to these sequencers right here. If I go over to a MIDI track here, go to the MIDI port. By the way, I have the MIDI out of the MPC Key 37 going into the MIDI in on the Labyrinth, and it accepts both MIDI notes and uh, clock information. So I believe if I hit play, yeah, the clock already starts playing right here. So that is a good thing to keep in mind right there if you want to clock this to the other systems. You can use the clock one and two right here to clock these two sequencers separately, separate speeds and all that. But back to the MIDI stuff right here, if I play the key, so I can treat this as a regular synthesizer now. And between these two decays right here, you can actually get some really interesting tones. Okay, I was going to tune this. I'm getting a little uh, distracted here. So I'm going to turn down the wave folding and I'm going to turn up the, the filter right here. I'm going to turn down resonance. I'm also going to increase EG2 decay so I get a nice note that rings out. So if I hit C, you can see where it's at right now. So one minor inconvenience about the fact that this is a 60 HP box is there's no fine tune control. So you kind of have to have super sensitive fingers <laughs> to be able to tune exactly. By the way, in the mixer, anything beyond noon is going to overdrive. So the, as you can hear, the sine wave is overdriving. If I bring it prior to noon, basically a sine wave at this point. So I turn that down. I'm going to turn up the triangle mod. And as you can see, it is C as well. So if I turn up both of these, So that's how you tune it right there. Now there is a built-in ring modulation as well uh, between the two VCOs, which is great because you can get some interesting tones between this and the noise, maybe a little bit of VCO, uh, regular VCO, and then wave folding. Already sounds awesome. By the way, the bias just shifts the center point of where the wave folding is happening, and it can get some really interesting crispy tones that way. One problem I have with this box is there is no direct way to patch uh, modulation into the bias, which I think personally is a shame. Like that's an interesting shift in harmonics that you can't modulate, unfortunately. It's okay though, because your hands are all over this to play it, and that's kind of the point behind this thing. So now that we have it tuned, let's turn down the wave folding. So the way I have sequencer one currently set up is I only have three steps hooked up right now. So if I hit play, turn down the noise. Oh, and also turn up the range. So I'm gonna increase the corruption all the way. So now it's just gonna keep on giving me random pitches. So with the keyboard, I just bumped it up an octave. Increase the tempo. So what's interesting about the corruptions, you can get various amounts of randomness. And as you can hear, some of this stuff is like, okay, yeah. And then suddenly some things can pop in that are interesting. So for instance, I can roll this corruption all the way back and then I just have these notes repeating right here. And then I can control the sequencer range. Let's take the decay back, which I think is pretty interesting. So for what I've found, having three steps and then having this corruption kick off uh, has been interesting. Or it, I think has provided the most interesting type of randomness for, for myself. What's not active right now is the sequence two because it's going to mod VCO, which I have down in the mix. So if I start bringing this in, and again, the CV range is all the way down, so it's not going to give anything interesting. It's just gonna provide the C note. But then if I start increasing it, I'm gonna turn the corrupt knob all the way down over here. If I start wave folding, and then the 
bias. Let's pop up the resonance and then sweep the cutoff. I think we already have something interesting here. And this is dry, obviously. There's no effects on there. If I were to throw some sort of delay... idea of the vibe that we can get. Air Delay Pro, that's a paid plugin by the way in the, the MPC. So this is what I think this box really excels at. Suddenly I'm performing with this sequence right here. And when I'm sick of it, or if I want something else, I throw in some more corruption. And then bring the corruption knob back down on sequence one. Bring it back up. Maybe bring in a lot of VCO. I think that's interesting personally I, I think it's a really fascinating way to perform and have like a collaborative experience with a box that honestly could pair really well with like a straight up basic sequence or something you know like if you have a regular bass line going on and just like some techno drums or something like you can get some interesting stuff just right away with something like this in fact let's throw in some sort of kick in here I'm gonna go over to a kit that I made a syntactical expression it's on the website if you want to pick it up. It's basically electron syntax samples put into MPC kits. Bump this speed up just a bit, maybe 124. Kick real quick to see. instant techno track. So one thing that I have not talked about at all is the scale quantization type stuff. So you have a lot of options here from uh, unquantized, chromatic, major, pentatonic, melodic minor, harmonic minor, diminished six, whole tone, Hirojoshi pentatonic, which I'm actually not even sure what that one is. And then you have some scales as well, so like major and minor scales, then hang drum tuning and quads tuning. So you have a lot of variety and options for your tuning of the quantizer. So for instance, what am I in right now? In order to change the quantization of the scales, you hold bit shift and then you either go uh, length or bit flip of the first sequencer. And it looks like I'm on number three, which is a major scale. So it is currently playing in C major. So I just grabbed a patch from Jura, Cloud Piano. So technically this should be in key. Tune my oscillator real quick. I think the temperature of the room is changing. In the middle of a heat wave in Sacramento. So 
So you notice I'm kind of playing in A minor essentially because C major is A minor. If you want to lock your notes specifically to a minor scale, natural minor, inside the labyrinth, you basically have to go to the relative major on here. So let's say I want to do C minor on here. What I have to do is tune this to E flat because E flat major is the relative major of C minor. That's kind of like what I'm talking about. You need to have a little bit of theory understanding and understand how to predict what it's going to get at. So if I go E flat on here now, so we should be getting a C minor. works <laughs> and that's kind of the idea behind things that are generative is you kind of get stuff that you go oh it wouldn't necessarily have gone that way but it went that way and now we're in this place that's feeling that way it's an interesting way of working throughout the month of using this guy i've really enjoyed where it's taking me to places and i haven't been able to technically replicate where i was a few minutes ago in a spot to get back to it whatever you're getting right now is usually not going to come back it's not going to come back because it's like random. So if this corruption knob is up at all, it's going to start rewriting things. I'm going to write a simple baseline real quick. So let me break down what's happening right here. Of the two sequencers right here, I have these patched into uh, the two oscillators right here, oscillator two and three of the Taiga keys. The first oscillator of the Taiga keys I'm actually playing. So that's its own signal path essentially. But with oscillator two and three, I'm actually patching these into VCW fold and VCF cutoff respectively. So oscillator two is being patched into the wave folding right here. And then oscillator three is being patched into the VCF. And with these, I have the order in parallel, so they will get blended together with this blend knob right here. So I can actually control how much of what I get. So for instance, if I just want to hear this second oscillator and this kind of like corruption uh, sequence, I can just play this. So if I turn up the sequence range, then I can start messing with the shape knob. change the shape completely. Let's go back to sine wave here. And then I can use the wave folding as well, which is really cool. Now, if 
if I use EG1 the CV amount. This is actually being patched right here with the fold. And it's actually the sine wave of oscillator 3. So whatever type of movement that's happening in sequence 2 that's controlling oscillator 3 is uh, giving the, uh, the EG1 CV amount a little character right there. It's pretty cool. So now if I switch this blend all the way over to VCF, now you're only hearing oscillator 3. And I can control the, the cutoff right here. See so if I switch back over to this, this cutoff does nothing. If I bring this back over, you can hear what's happening here. Let's bring the resonance all the way down. Bring this down as well. If I up the crop knob, it starts getting different values while keeping the rhythm. Let's keep with that. Bring the CV range down. So if I slightly blend these, So LFO1, I'm taking the triangle signal out, and I'm actually putting it into UMix level 1. I'm basically just using it as an attenuator because full LFO is too much on there. But what I wanted to do is use LFO1 to control how much blend is happening with this knob right here. So I have UMix 1, 2 patched out into the blend right here. And then as I bring this up, if I start playing this, so this is just sequence 2 right now that you're hearing. And as I bring this up, hear how the LFO is adjusting that. So if I increase the LFO, get some interesting audio rate type of stuff. LFO 1 is also controlling uh, oscillator 2 as well, so this melody, if I increase this, So getting a, a variety of complexity with it. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of crazy. With the DigiTac 2, I have the MIDI out going directly into the MIDI in of Labyrinth. That's how it's getting its clock. So if I start playing, this starts playing, and then I can just add in percussion easily. Get my techno thing going on. So if you're the type of person that likes generative, explorative type of things, I think this is a no-brainer. Assuming you understand the synthesis and the the key uh, music theory behind the stuff to make it work. Because again, you can get into some places that are just like what's happening with the box really fast with this if you don't understand a lot of the principles that are going into it. With that said, let's talk about some cons or some limitations specifically. So even though you have a nice patch bay over here and everything's relatively well laid out, there's things that you can't do with it. Like for instance, if you want to patch something into this mixer, you can't. You can only patch out of the mixer or you can only have the mixer output patched into something else. I had mentioned no fine-tuned points for the, the VCOs. It bugs me, honestly. But um, again, there's only so much space in a 60 HP type of box that you can do. The lack of a modulation patch point for the bias also is a real bummer. I think there's a lot of character in there that's kind of missing, not being able to patch like a really fast modulation type of thing in there. Another thing that you can't patch into is the CV range. And this is another thing I think would have been really nice from a generative point of view. You have to specifically control the CV ranges with your hands at all times if you want to do any kind of adjustments on there. And honestly, uh, over time, since there's going to be so much performance with these knobs, I wonder how durable these knobs are going to be 
in the long run. I don't own any of the previous Moog gear that's like the, the Mother 32 or the DFAM, so I can't give you any kind of perspective on that. Uh, they're probably fine. Same thing with the Corruption. You can't patch into these, but I don't think I mind this as much because I probably would want to be more specific with the Corruption type of stuff. Uh, and also you can patch in bit flips as well. So you can actually have a really large setup that is patching in bit flips to uh, to control the generation on here. Personally, I haven't done that yet, so I can't speak to how useful that is. I could see that being an interesting option, but I also am not sure how useful that would be for musical type of sounding things. It'd probably be really interesting for like percussion. One thing I haven't really talked about is a chain sequence. So you can chain sequence one into sequence two and they'll both run. And there were some things I thought you could be able to do with it that you can't. Let me explain. So what this will do is make it so as it plays, you can see it literally chains together, as you would expect, obviously. And what happens is both sequence one CV range and sequence two CV range are treated separately, even though they have both sequences going into them. So this presents some interesting options here. So you can actually have like a 16 step sequence two range be really minimal, like only like a couple notes that are wiggling that are going to the mod VCO. And then you could have sequence one range that has both the sequence one and sequence two 16 steps stacked together, have the full CV range on there. So you can have these interesting counterpoints that are happening right here. You have like a higher melody type of thing and then something else that's more consistent low end. And this is what I mean. I, I like performing with this. So one thing that I thought was going to be possible that is not possible with this chained sequencer type of stuff is you can't have sequence one CV range connected with sequence two CV range changes. That sounds confusing, so let me explain. So you can't have steps one, two, three of sequence one be a, a certain amount of CV range, and then steps one through eight right here be CV range of like zero, essentially. You can't chain it like that. Sequence one CV range is always gonna be its own separate thing, and sequence two CV range is gonna be its own separate thing. So what's not possible is to have, say, step one and three of sequence one be uh, locked to one note, and then have, say, steps one through five of sequence two be random and jumping around. That's not possible because the CV ranges are separated from each other. And honestly, it's probably for the better because that way you get some more interesting counterpoint type of tones and all that. What I thought was gonna be possible with the method that I was talking about is to make a like a baseline generator where you have two notes that are consistent, that are always like the root note, and then the second sequence takes over for some interesting melodic changes but that's not possible. And honestly, as a baseline generator, you're probably gonna to wanna to have something consistent like in an MPC or another sequencer that can be a bit more solid, more predictable, and then let the labyrinth do more generative, interesting counterpoint type of melodies. It's like adding interesting details randomly to it. Let's talk about manufacturing. So as we know, in music, purchase Moog. It is no longer an employee owned company. And from what I was told, their 60 HP devices have always been manufactured in Taiwan but now the difference is they're being assembled there as well. Also, I believe they stopped printing manuals. Again, I haven't purchased a previous Mother 32 or a DFAM yet, so I didn't get to see what comes in those boxes, but there is no manual inside of the Labyrinth. You gotta look online for stuff like that. I obviously got a little cue card here for a cheat sheet, and I did get some cables as well, but these cables are not marked as Moog anymore. With the Matriarch, I got some cables that were specifically Moog branded. Right here, it says Moog on the side. The new ones do not. These are generic branded patch cables. Does that matter to you? Does it kill your interest in the labyrinth? Let me know in the comments. In terms of build quality, it seems solid. These two knobs right here were a little stiff initially uh, when I first opened up the box, but over time they've loosened up, so I, I don't think that's an issue, and maybe that was the case with other Made in Asheville versions of Moog products. And honestly, the labyrinth as a collaborative generative tool really is awesome. I personally think it hits the mark. And the way the layout is set up for tweaking and performance, I think is really smart. I like the fact that the VCOs are off to the side because if you set those for tuning, you don't want to bump them, obviously. And so having the, the main stuff to manipulate sound is good to have over here. There's a ton of things to explore here and I obviously haven't tested everything out. I did patch it in with some bigger modular type of stuff and it plays really nice. Also is like a synth voice. I think it is actually really interesting sounding. And 
by the way, if you are planning on picking up the Labyrinth and you want to support the channel, using my affiliate links is one of the best ways of doing that as well. So thank you very much if you do plan on that. But overall, I really like this box. I think it's interesting. But as a, a collaboration tool in a modular setup, I think it really hits the mark. You kind of just have to get your hands on it and try it and see for yourself if it speaks to you in that way. It's definitely not going to be for everyone, but if you are into that generative side of things and want to run into like happy accidents, this could be the box for you. That's it. That's the video. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate you making it to the end. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next time for another one. Peace.